Hi everyone, hope you're well today. Let's do the chanting straight away. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo dasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Udham saranam gachami, dhammam saranam gachami, sangham saranam gachami, dutayambi udham saranam gachami, dutayambi dhammam saranam gachami, dutayambi sangham saranam gachami, tadayambi udham saranam gachami, tadayambi dhammam saranam gachami, tadayambi sangham saranam gachami. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Sangaya. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by practicing the six paramitas, may I soon attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and its causes. May they be free from suffering and its causes. May they never be parted from the happiness beyond suffering. May they abide in equanimity, free of bias, attachment to the near and aversion from the far. I shall cause this. Great compassionate Buddha, please inspire me to be able to do so. Reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech and mind and present clouds of every types of offerings, actual and mentally transformed. I confess all of my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in all the virtues of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until cyclic existence ends and turn the wheel of Dharma for all sentient beings. I dedicate the virtues of myself and others to the great enlightenment. However innumerable all sentient beings are, I vow to save them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are, I vow to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are, I vow to master them all. However endless the Buddha's way is, I vow to follow it completely. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om Mani Padme Hum. Tayata um gate gate para gate para sum gate bodhi so. Tayata um gate gate para gate para sum gate bodhi so. Tayata um gate gate para gate para sum gate bodhi so. So now get yourself in a comfortable position for the meditation practice. Initially, we will, as per usual, we will release the tension in the body. So from the tips of the toes all the way up your body to your shoulders, then down to the tips of your fingers and back to the top of your head. And as you pass certain areas that have a little bit of tension, release the tension, either just by you know releasing with your mind or you can utilize releasing with your mind as well as the breathing, the out breath. Or you can even stretch a little bit if you like or rub it a little bit. Okay, so... Let's do this in silence just for a short while. Now scan your body again to see if there's any more tension that you can release. And if there is, do that. Now bring your mind to the tip of your nose 
and follow the feeling of the breath as you breathe in your nose, all the way into your lungs, then back out your nose again. So we are practicing Anapanasati, mindfulness of the breath, which is included in the practice of Satipatthana, which means the four foundations of mindfulness. The form or a physicality. The second foundation are the mental feelings or sensations. The third foundation is the mind itself. And the fourth foundation are the activities of the mind which actually includes all thoughts, all concepts, perceptions, and includes the Dharma, the Dharma with the big D, capital D, which represents the truth as well as the Buddhist teachings, which lead to the truth, and small d, which is um, phenomena, all things mental. Okay, so all mental activities. So as we engage in this um, practice of the breath meditation, we engage the four foundations of mindfulness. So as you breathe in, breathe out, focusing on your breath, on the feeling of your breath. If any thoughts arise or mental activity arises, just recognize it. It's a passing phenomena. Don't cling to it. Don't grasp at it. Also, don't try to force it away or deny it. But let it go naturally and simply by replacing your mind back onto your breath. And if your mind starts to become dull or sleepy, then replace your mind onto your breath more rapidly. To focus and will help you focus on the breath, you can also add the extra technique of counting the breaths from one to ten. One in breath and one out breath is one and so on. But if you get distracted while counting to ten, go back to one at that time. Don't count past ten because we want the breath to remain the focus, the object of the meditation. So let's practice in silence like this for a little bit.
So now we can feel very pleased with ourselves for engaging in the practice. And now let's switch techniques to the loving kindness meditation. Let's fill ourselves with the universal loving kindness, fill our whole being with this feeling of friendship, acceptance, harmlessness, nonviolence, of benefit, honesty, and so forth. You can utilize the visualization technique of filling yourself with the white light or white nectar. <laughs> Fill your whole being with this universal love and kindness. Fill yourself with so much love and kindness that it now overflows and begins to radiate outwards, initially to your loved ones, your family, your friends, and fills them with a the universal love and kindness too. So if you are utilizing the visualization technique of filling yourself with white light initially, now the white light radiates outwards and fills the being and the beings that are in front of you during this visualization. And if you can't really get clear visualization, that's fine. You know, just realize that these beings are there, realize that we're filled with the universal love and kindness, and realize that we are filled with the light and radiate, radiated outwards and so forth, okay? And now radiate to those you are indifferent towards, may regard as strangers, whether you know them a little or not at all. Filling them with the universal love and kindness. Normally it's very easy to extend the love and kindness and friendship to our loved ones, those beings that predominantly have been very kind to us. A little bit more difficult to extend it to those we don't really know or have any attachment towards or aversion from. And now also we will radiate this love and kindness to those we may regard as enemies, which is a little bit more difficult because they may have harmed you in the past or maybe their, their behaviour is terrible. You find it very difficult to even think about them. But right now you're changing the ways Rather than having this resentful mind and the negative mind, you are now transforming that into love and kindness and friendship towards all living beings. Filling them now with this universal love and kindness. All of these three types of people, from our own perspective, may they have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. And may they be peaceful. Now let's extend this love and kindness out further and further, distance-wise, and to all living beings now, not just people. Initially around your immediate area, could be around your house or property, or even if you want to go a bit further than that, your local park, the beach, or even sort of like the local area type of thing, up to you. To all of the living beings, whether they live in the waters or on the land, fly through the air, whether they're born from wombs, eggs, moisture, or through transformation. All living beings, whether weak or strong, great or small, short or tall, seen or unseen, near or distant, born or to be born, may they all be happy, free from suffering, and be peaceful. Now let's extend this loving kindness out further and further again to include all of the living beings and all of the inanimate object, objects as well as everything to do with nature throughout your whole state or county. And other states and counties throughout the whole world.
or I should say your whole country and all of the countries throughout the whole world, those you're, you have an affinity towards, those you're indifferent towards, and those for whatever, whatever reason you have some sort of negative vibes about, negative feelings towards. May your loving kindness pervade throughout all of these lands, as well as throughout all of the oceans, down to the core of the earth and to the outermost atmosphere. Now have your loving kindness pervade beyond this planet alone, throughout the whole solar system, the whole galaxy, the universe, and throughout infinite space. This immeasurable loving kindness, this infinite loving kindness, benefiting innumerable li living beings. Also be present here and now, and we will recite the dedication prayer. Due to this merit, may I soon attain the enlightened state of the Buddha, so that I may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering. And may the precious body, Chitta, not yet born, rise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. And may the precious view of Shunyata, not yet born, rise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. And so we will continue to address the questions that were asked throughout last year while we were having the commentary on the eight verses of thought transformation, utilizing my book. And so there was a couple of questions that actually came in uh, last week as well. And um, just curious um, students from overseas. And um, they wanted to know about what uh, Buddhism does with Valentine's Day and stuff like that, which has been asked many times before. And I actually addressed it in detail by giving, I think, like one and a half classes on the five types of love um, and, you know, whether Buddhism sort of like pays attention to this or not. And um, I think it was maybe two years ago. It could have been three years ago. And to, at the moment, what I'm doing, when the memories of the previous Zoom classes come around, on Facebook as I'm sharing them. So sometime next week, I think there will be, and the week after maybe, there will be actually something shared from the memory. So if you are interested in finding out more about it in more detail, then, because I actually gave a lot of details whenever I gave the teaching on this, you know, the sort of different percentages of different qualities that are included approximately within each of these different types of love and kindness um, and so on. Uh, but today I'll keep it really short. Okay, the first question that came um, that uh, I wanted to address straight up top was, "What are the four foundations of mindfulness?" And I mentioned that prior to our meditation. So the mindfulness, um, the four foundations of mindfulness, um, Satipatthana in Pali, um, uh, the the foundation of the form or our physicality, the foundation of the feelings, in specifically the mental feelings which are either pleasurable, um, unpleasant, or neutral. Then the uh, foundation of the mind itself, and then the foundation of the mind activities or actions or activities of the mind, which includes the Dharma from the perspective of the Buddhist teachings, Dharma meaning truth as well, as well as all phenomena. Like I said, in English, we tend to, um, we tend to translate or write down dharma or dhamma in Pali um, with the capital D if it represent or if it's um, mentioning the Buddhist teachings or if it's mentioning the truth, ultimate truth, and dharma um, with a small d if we're talking about phenomena because the word dharma can mean phenomena as well. <clears throat> Whether this to do be to do with physical phenomena or mental phenomena, so I wanted to mention that. Because uh, that wasn't to be covered, I don't think, in some of the teachings um, that I have um, coming up um, uh, from the book. And then also the different types of so-called love or friendship or loving kindness. We can use all of these words. Universal loving kindness is the way that I like to express metta or, so, or maha metta, the great uh, universal loving kindness. Also, we can apply the word universal to karuna, so the compassion, or maha karuna, the great compassion. 
Okay, so you know, because they are inseparable, these these qualities, uh, because based on a mind of equanimity, they also include empathetic joy. So these are the four immeasurables. So that that is the ultimate um, loving kindness, you could say. That is the universal one. That is the one we are aiming towards. So when we talk about metta, this is what we are talking about: developing this innumerable and immeasurable, sorry, immeasurable loving kindness that can benefit innumerable living beings and developing it beyond limit, okay, infinite. And so the other ones are all conditioned, okay? So metta is unconditioned when developed beyond measure, obviously. But these other ones, say at the bottom, you could say is possessive love. This is quite negative and mostly negative. You think you have a possession. Let's say you, you have a partner and you feel you possess this, this partner. Okay, so it's negative. I won't go into any more detail because, like I said, you know, these memories keep coming up now. So for the previous, um, you know, three years, um, three and a half years, actually, since we started doing these classes, or a little bit more. And um, so obviously possessive love, try to avoid that. Then we have romantic love, which has a certain element of really good, good things. You know, it makes you feel nice and so forth. Uh, but it's still very, um, you could say, possessive in a certain sense. It's conditioned, okay? Then um, then we have, by the way, if you are involved with romantic love, then really respect each other, you know, really appreciate each other. Anyway, so then um, we have the parental love, um, which is really good. Um, the parent, you know, obviously cares so much for their offspring, their child, and... Um, this is really, they would even give up their own life for this child on most occasions, as mentioned as an example in the Metta Sutta. Okay, so very good, potentially uh, mainly very good, but still um, kind of ownership involved, isn't it? Like, for instance, if, you, if your child does well, then you are very happy for them. And um, then... Uh, other person's child, especially maybe the child that maybe behaves badly or their parents behave badly, maybe you don't think about them or maybe you don't, if, you know, on, in a worst-case scenario, you actually think, you know, you don't want them to be uh, happy, so forth. So anyway, um, then, of course, we have endearing love. This is kind of like a love that is, um, you know, you, where you get, you see a little puppy or a little kitten or some sort of baby animal, um, or other creatures or humans, <laughs> um, and, you, and you go, oh, isn't that nice? And you actually want to protect them, you know. So this endearing love is really similar to parental love, but it's actually maybe goes beyond that because it can include other living beings, you know, not just your own baby or child. Okay, so there, that's just a little bit of a sort of a brief way of explaining the five different types of love. Of course, the word love, um, don't mistake it for lust, okay? Well, I'm using the word love here to express loving kindness and eventually universal loving kindness, which, uh, is, like I said before many times, it's very, this word metta is very closely related to the word mitra, which means friend, okay, or friendly, okay? So we'll leave that there, and now I'll get into the book. So it didn't take too long for me to explain those things, but, um, which is good. But I wanted. I didn't feel that I was going to be able to um, get to those those questions during this period, and I thought that the you know, important time of year as well. Okay. Oh, the the other thing is, do Buddhists um, celebrate Valentine's Day? Once again, look at the uh, that memory when I share it. Um, but you don't have to. <laughs> it's the. I mean, you can if you want. Um, like I said before, special days. Maybe you can utilize them to improve. I care for others. And if you do have a partner, for instance, you know, show your appreciation during this time. But maybe you can just utilize days like this to do it every day. You know, like, like in Buddhism, for instance, uh, the practice of repentance, for instance. Um, normally within the traditions, they do the repentance practice like twice a month or every two weeks. Um, but actually, you should do it every day. In fact, we do it in the prayers, you know. So if you do those prayers, before class every day, then you're actually doing repentance practice every day. And if you couple that then, of course, with the, um, the positive regret, 
the strong resolve not to engage in negativities again towards a virtuous object like the Buddha and engage in the practice wholeheartedly and um, accurately, then actually you are really practicing the repentance very, very well. Okay. That's just a little thing I wanted to mention. Okay, my glasses. So um, number 33 out of 50. Um, says, and I didn't go into this one last week because of it being very in-depth. It's not hugely long, you know, it's like three medium-sized paragraphs and one big paragraph in the explanation. <clears throat> and a medium-sized paragraph is, is the actual quote itself. Can one moment change everything? So this is actually the initial quote. It's a question that I ask, you could say rhetorical question for you to go away and think about in a sense because there really is no answer. You can't say yes, you can't say no, you can't say yes and no, or neither yes and no. You know, the four ways to check out things, okay? Um, so can one moment change everything? This is kind of a little bit related to, um, or in fact, I've already got the, in the explanation, so I'm not gonna mention it, okay? So the answer is yes and no. Like I said before, actually, that's not even an answer either. How can you express what we call emptiness? How can you express that which is signless and wishless? You know? But uh, for the purpose of convenience and explanation right now, we have to use this language, these words, this expression. No, because one moment is not all moments, everything. And yes, because one moment is not separate from all moments or everything. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Hopefully you do. But very deep teaching, okay? And, but I don't understand. I don't understand everything either, you know? But I'm sharing this with you. Whatever level of understanding I have, I give to you. Whatever level of understanding is yours. But you don't own anything, so it's not yours. Sounds like a riddle, but contemplate these words, okay? So I will repeat that. Can one moment change everything? The answer is yes and no. No, because one moment is not all moments or everything. And yes, because one moment is not separate from all moments or everything. The continuum, conscious continuum, if it's related to the mind, this thought or this state of mind, this moment of mind we have right now has come from previous moments of mind, interconnected. So it stands alone by itself because it's not the same exactly as previous moments, because we've changed slightly. I'll explain that more in a moment. But, and, and will lead to subsequent moments. But it's not separate from the previous thoughts and so forth. They're not separate from what will become the subsequent thoughts. Okay. So the explanation says, we could say that all phenomena, including the concept of time, of past, present, and future, both exists and doesn't exist. It exists dependently and doesn't exist independently. It exists conditioned and doesn't exist unconditioned. Each moment is conditioned by and dependent on the preceding moment. And in turn, this moment conditions the subsequent moment. For example, if in this moment, of consciousness, your mind is clouded with confusion and worry. And if it is left unchecked, then the subsequent moment of consciousness will be likewise. Conversely, if in this moment of consciousness, your mind is peaceful and clear, then the subsequent moment of consciousness will be likewise. So a little footnote there at the end of this paragraph. So do your best to keep your mind peaceful and clear. So this is like a little extra teaching on top of the actual, you could say philosophical teaching in a sense, but it's not philosophical. The, the, the definitive teaching really of emptiness. Uh, this includes impermanence, obviously. Remember the three marks of existence, uh, um, that are all things, mental and physical, or conditioned things I should add. Uh, impermanence, anicca or anitya. They have the nature of being unsatisfactory or of suffering, dukkha, and they have no self, no self to be found anywhere. There's no independent 
separate self. No self, anatta, or in Sanskrit, anatman. You can also add shunyata to that, which is the emptiness of self, emptiness of substantiality, emptiness of the separate or independent self. Okay, but of course, we add the extra teaching here. Keep your mind peaceful and clear. Then the next moment will be peaceful and clear. And whatever arises then in your life, whether it's difficult or whether you really like it, and you're going to get too much attachment, then in that moment, you get the opportunity with a clear, peaceful mind to realize this is impermanent and there's no self nature. Let's say it is difficulties. Something arises, you know that, ah, this is it's no self nature here. It's just results of karma and will pass. It's conditioned. Okay. Um, in relation, and this is what I was going to mention before, in relation to another type of phenomena, let's take, for example, water, H2O, or hydrogen and oxygen and the right balance of it. Water exists dependent on an even balance and mixture <clears throat> of hydrogen and oxygen, but does not exist when one of these parts is absent or the mixture of these parts is not balanced. Think about that once again. I recall a couple of times in the past that during these Dharma classes online that I've said, here, I'm having a drink. It's water. Quenching my thirst. If the water didn't exist, I would still be thirsty. But it exists. It's a nice balance in there of the hydrogen and oxygen, the correct balance. But you take away any of these parts or make it imbalanced, and the water does not exist at that time. But also look at it from the point of view of water. We call it water. Oh, Spanish, agua. Italian, aqua. You know, other languages, obviously, other words. It's just called that. This is just imputing some sort of concept on something and a name. And so that that's the kind of like uh, imputed nature of it and other things and all other conditioned things. The relational nature, very simply, hydrogen, oxygen, and a balance of these. The ultimate nature, pointless, even thinking about it. It's, it's not water. It's only a sound. It's only a name. It's only a concept. Neither here nor there. Neither coming nor going. Same for the mind. Okay. Same for all phenomena. So um, all conditioned phenomena, including each moment, only exists dependent on causes and conditions. It's subject to constant change, unsatisfactory, and empty of independent substance. So I'll leave that there so we can go on to the next one. I know this is similar to teachings I've given before, isn't it, on emptiness during the commentary on the six paramitas, during the commentary on specifically the eighth verse of the eighth verse of thought transformation and other times too. Um, so important teachings though. But I will recite my song again, everything. Okay. Everything is like a flicker of a lamp, the life of a flower. A star at dawn, a dewdrop, dewdrop, <laughs> dewdrop in the sun. Everything is like the changing of the tides, lightning in a summer cloud, a bubble in a stream, a phantom and a dream. Thus shall we think of all this fleeting world. Of course, this is inspired by the Diamond Sutra, Mahaprajna Paramita Vajrachadipa Sutra, or the Diamond Cutter, Perfection of Wisdom Scripture, in verse 32 of 32 verses. And uh, the Buddha gave, you know, how to practice. And he mentioned some of these things. I've added a few things. Did change the words a little bit. I think I added the changing of the tithe or the life of a flower. And um, the other ones are pretty much the same except uh, embellished a little bit, the same meaning, okay? So I leave that there. The next one, number 34, clothes serve more purpose than merely decorating our body. 
So we're wearing clothes now, right? If we weren't, then maybe we'd get arrested on online, on Zoom. Um, but there's a purpose for wearing clothes, isn't it? It's not just about decorating the body. Now, a lot of people throughout the world probably do this. They just dress to impress, to use a bit of poetry. Um, actually, really, the, think about the clothes. Like, let's say, for instance, like I think when I was back when I was younger and the you know, young, pretty ladies, they'd go out and see my band play, for instance, or other things, and they would middle of winter, you know, and they don't have many things on. They didn't want to bring a jacket because it's either inconvenient or it wasn't in fashion. And I'm thinking, you must be freezing, you know, so <laughs> little things like that. So to dress to impress. And, of course, we all did it when we were younger. I did it. You know, look back now, it's very silly stuff, but it's part of uh, what people do in, in life. Part of also to do with working and trying to, you know, get the job you want. And if you work in a bank, you can't go in there and surfboard shorts and a singlet, you know, things like that. Okay. Um, if you, you know, diamond teachers, monks, nuns, whatever, you wear robes. Uh, other times, maybe not because you may be exercising in, in the garden or whatever, depending on the tradition, of course. Um, uh, we're all a little bit different sometimes. Anyway, the explanation says, the main purpose for wearing clothes is to protect our body from the elements, such as cold, heat, wind, and rain. So I'll explain that very, 20 seconds I'll take to, to explain that. Uh, that should be very obvious. When it's cold, put more clothes on. Put more clothes that are warmer. If it's hot, put clothes that maybe you can even spray with water and things like that, you know, just to cool down a little bit. Um, also, our clothes can help us to be modest, humble and respectful. That's another reason for, you know, wearing certain clothes, just the, the humility, um, the, res the respect that you're showing, uh, the modesty like that. Um, and even help it to remind us to practice the Dharma. So there's certain things you can put on your body um, such as uh, monk or nun robes or other clothes that maybe you wear when you practice dharma, the beads, the whatever it may be that uh, remind you to practice the dharma. This is uh, possible as well, depending on your intention. So I know that we're under a minute. I think we'll just leave that one there. I was going to go into teaching on emptiness as well, but we don't need to. Okay. So now I encourage you to practice well, share the dharma well. I rejoice as always, in your goodness, in your merits. I look forward to seeing you next week. Namo Buddhaya.